<laughs> great stuff. Okay. I'm, I'm going to hand to you, Jennifer. You're, you're up. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us again um, on this week's TU Dublin broadcast. Uh, this is the last of the three broadcasts this week from TU Dublin. And today's theme of consciousness is called uh, connectedness, uh, virtual and corporal. And it's to do with ourselves uh, and ourselves and others. So I suppose it's about uh, thinking about how we can create meaningful modern experiences to somehow maintain our collective individuality as we continue to practice um, in both uh, the architecture studios, in the architecture schools, but then also out in the professional domain. So today our two guest speakers are coming to us from the point of view of architectural practice as it too is a very, um, I suppose, under review and revision and constantly adapting to the new restrictions that are being imposed on us by the pandemic. And um, the link between architectural education and practice is really strong and very interdependent in many ways. And as I suppose time speeds up um, and students become practitioners themselves, and as um, the academy begins to bring back and reinforce that idea of practice uh, in the profession, the links um, uh, are that bit more, um, I suppose, evolving um, and interdependent in that way. So uh, as we have, and we are still adapting to our new academic environment in the architectural design studio, so two are practices big and small, uh, each with their own cultures and their own clients in mind. So our first guest is Miriam Corcoran, an associate at Henry J. Lyons Architects here in Dublin. Miriam is also a graduate of TU Dublin, formerly DIT, and was the first Morrison scholarship winner in her final thesis project in 2014. Miriam also teaches as a part-time assistant lecturer at TU Dublin and on one of our first face-to-face -face meetings on campus in September where I met the full first year studio team to talk through how we would conduct our teaching practices on site, Miriam shared a modest but very useful innovation from her experiences in Henry J. Lyons to the studio environment with us and that was that of the collaboration table. So this simple but very effective spatial proposal um, allows for students and lecturers in the studio wearing PPE to sit at two meter distances around a large format table and collaborate and discuss drawings, models, and essentially satisfy that need for proximate peer learning, which everybody is very thankful to have in this new blended environment. So today, Miriam's gonna share with us a number of other innovations as well that she's using to help Henry J. Lyons cultivate uh, the culture of their collaborative studio environment during the pandemic. Uh, and I'll, I'll hand over now to Miriam. Thanks very much. Great. Well, thanks for that introduction, Jennifer. Um, I'm going to just try share my screen now and bring up a little presentation. Okay, so um, as Jennifer mentioned today, I'm going to be talking all about communication and collaboration in architectural design practice. Um, mostly centered around my own practice, Henry J. Lyons, um, but also relating it back to uh, the design studio in, uh, in architecture schools. So I'm going to start with a few photos first. Um, so this is architecture students in the Bauhaus from 1928. This is my own studio in um, formerly DIT in about 2012. Uh, this is a uh, photo from practice from Frank Lloyd Wright studio in um, the early 60s and this is a photo uh, from my own studio energy lines probably about last year so I suppose the links between them are pretty obvious for me the main the main obvious link is this idea that even though technology has advanced so much in the in the interim years between these photos uh, the spatial configuration of a studio has remained consistent really and you know architects work best when they are uh, together and communicating collaborating and talking and drawing and model making and all those things that we do in um, the, a big communal space um, and I suppose what I want to talk about today is how that uh, normally happens in the in the normal non-covid course of things 
in uh, my office because that's where my experience lies um, and then how we've had to adapt. So I will get straight into it. So, so this is uh, our office building on Pier Street. Uh, so it is a Georgian, there's a, a Georgian front, like three Georgian houses to the front. Um, and then there is a, um, an extended building out to the back. And how the office really is structured is that these are all um, large open floor uh, offices. And that's really where everyone works. And then the Georgian uh, more small roomed section to the front are really just for formal meetings, reception, things like that. And then there's larger uh, communal areas in the basement to, to get together. So um, even though there's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really big practice, there's about 250-ish uh, staff working there at the moment, most of which are architects. And there obviously is hierarchical structures, um, but in reality, that's really how projects work. And it's, it's not so hierarchical at all in, in the normal running of things. And it's really democratic and everyone has a say and everyone's involved and everyone talks to everyone. And if that's the director and this is the project lead um, and these are the other team members, you know, everyone is, everyone's engaged with everyone else. Um, and I suppose the physical, spaces in our office uh, support that way of working and then the question is when those physical things are taken away how does that how does that manifest itself so uh, this is an image of our just typical open plan floors so as I said really everyone sits there from you know the directors to associate directors to graduates to support staff and everyone is sitting in this open plan space and we are learning from each other constantly you know even if it's just a case of you're maybe doing your own thing and you're drawing and you're listening into frank down the row having a conversation with the builder on because that project's on site and you're listening into another conversation about urban design and you're passing someone's screen and you're seeing something interesting or you're seeing something pinned up on the wall but essentially you're um you're surrounded by this hive of activity um, in a similar way to you are in the design studio at college and you are just constantly learning. There's, uh, we have uh, collaboration desks at various points throughout that open plan office as well, you know, area, more informal areas where you can stand up and have a chat about a drawing. Uh, seated desks where you can gather around and sketch ideas obviously as Jennifer mentioned when we were um, temporarily allowed back in the office uh, uh, in phased stages over the summer you know that was physically spread out and these photos are obviously pre-COVID um, and then there's in the Georgian part of the building you have the the smaller rooms where you can have more formal meetings typically maybe with external design consultants or your clients there's larger space, there's a larger space in the basement with folding walls where um, spatially you can create a huge space where the entire office can get together for project presentations or CBDs. Um, but more often than not, it's really just the rolling your chair over to your colleague's desk and having, uh, having those chats about design and about problem solving and all those things that we do um, constantly really. Um, and similarly, you bump into someone on your way to coffee or the bathrooms or whatever that is and you're oh didn't you do something similar last year how did you solve that and how did you work around that and and that's really how it operated we also went to site visits um, of our colleagues projects that were in progress so these are some site visits that I went to over the last year or two well not, not this year previously and stock exchange there was probably my last site visit before lockdown and then this happened and um, obviously we had to uh, pretty quickly transition to working from home. And um, so you had a case where, you know, there was 250 people working all together in an office and suddenly everyone, all of those people are individually at home working on their own. And how do you deal with that? And how do you, you know, maintain the demands of a busy, a busy practice? And how do you keep meeting your deadlines? And um, so at the start, I suppose it was, it was kind of, we went into emergency mode and it was business continuity and it was, um, working remote policies and it was, uh, quite pragmatic in terms of setting up people with laptops and 
headsets and making sure the software was in place and um, making sure we could uh, still meet our deliverables. And uh, the communication tools were really, you know, in the ones that everyone's used to now, you know, the, um, the Google Meet is our other one we mostly use and, um, and all these things. It's about, it was about, you know, how to do site inspections and site visits safely. Um, but, you know, so that all was fine and obviously it was what needed to be done at the time. But um, after a few months, I suppose, when things settled down a bit, it became apparent that there was, a, you know, something we had lost along the way, which was that um, the informal learning. So, yes, we were able to communicate within your small team about the project at hand. But what became apparent to myself and, and my colleague Sarah especially was that, you know, we talked about that. Yes, you were communicating with your team. Yes, you were getting your drawings done. Yes, you were getting that tender submitted or whatever. But um, it was quite insular and you weren't getting uh, the bigger picture of what was going on in the office and you weren't having those informal chats and you weren't being inspired as much by, you know, those that drawing that you would walk by and see on someone else's screen who might be at a different stage or doing a different uh, doing different projects. So this is my friend Sarah. So we got together, our director, we had both talked to um our uh, managing director about it and he said so get together and come up with a strategy so we did so we were trying to i suppose um like <laughs> acknowledging that the physical spaces previously had supported our communi communication and collaboration and then how do you do that um virtually and how do you make it uh less formal i suppose was the was the main thing so we came up with this strategy um, where we had three strands, project presentations, Friday fix, and team check-ins. So I might just quickly go through those. By the way, I can't really see what time it is. So someone tell me if I'm going way over. So- You're doing fine. You're like in five minutes now, Miriam. Great, thanks. <laughs> um, so project presentations, to be fair, there was already project presentations happening, um, but they were all staff um, and, they were, it's great, you know, they, they worked really well. So my um, friend and colleague Maria um, with her director, Pete, presented the Tokyo project that um, she designed and won the OREI competition recently. And that was amazing. And it was great for the whole office to look at. And we saw this lovely project, Wilton, which I didn't know really anything about because it's done by a different team. Um, and while that is great, um, you know, but I suppose having a 250 or 200, 250 people listening in is quite daunting and it makes it quite formal. And there's a lot of prep work involved and um, there's maybe it's more difficult to, I suppose, interject and ask questions and get involved, especially for younger uh, staff members. Uh, so we um, thought that instead of going for the whole office project presentations, we would just focus on our own team, which we're the ground floor team under uh, Richard and Pete's directorship. So um, we have started uh, these project presentations where they're a bit informal and it's really just to replace that normal course of things in the office floor where you would walk by someone's desk and you, oh, what are you working on there? Or they'd be folding their planning pack and you'd, you know, go and sit down and have a look at their drawings. So um, this is the first one that is up, which is uh, Project Shoreline, which is a big residential project. Um, I might go next. This is my project, which is on site currently and nearly finished. So maybe when that hits PC, hopefully soon, a few weeks, um, I'll present that. Um, so then there is, so I suppose moving down in steps of formality, then we come up with this idea of a Friday fix. Um, and this is in part, is, is really to just get that, that peer learning going um, and also to kind of wind down on a Friday and, you know, have a beer with your chats on a Friday evening. Um, so the idea of this is that um, it's to just replace those uh, those things that you might even overhear on the office floor um, and the, just the very informal learning. So the idea of this one is that it's really quick. It's just a 15 minute thing. Every single person on the team is going to be made to it eventually from graduates to directors. And you just present something topical to you, something maybe that you were working on that week or something that you're particularly good at or interested in. So um, we had our first one last week, which was really successful. And Rob Salmon went and he is really good at tenders. So he gave his top tips on tenders. And um, so it was really interesting. And he had some lovely diagrams. It was, it was more professional than we were expecting, but um, that's Rob for you. So uh, 
and we have our second one this evening and that is going to be Carmel Murray and she's going to be talking on um, the relationship between the window and the room in hotel design. She's just submitted a hotel for planning out at the airport. And so I'm looking forward to that one. And then I think next we have um, Maria going on uh, stair design and how you achieve, you can still achieve beautiful stair designs while still complying with part M of the building regulations, which are very onerous for non um, domestic dwellings. So that is the Friday fix. And um, yeah, I suppose the, the main idea with the, that is really just to encourage conversations. So when we had the first one last week, you know, Rob presented 15 minutes, but then there was a 45 minute chat afterwards where everyone was talking about their experiences and, oh yeah, and this happened to me. And, you know, what I think is the problem in us and, you know, it spawned more conversation and more topics. And, and it's just, yeah, I suppose just replicating what would normally happen. And then there is the daily check-in. And um, so that is really just, uh, I mean, everyone is checking in all the time anyway, but just kind of putting a structure on it. So even if you don't think there's anything to check in on that day, or you think, oh no, I have, I have my work to do. I don't need to. Um, just to put a system in place that every day, everyone checks in with their team. Um, and whether it's an 11 o'clock coffee and maybe it's just talking about what you did that weekend or an interesting podcast that you listened to or um, an article that you read in Architecture Ireland, you know, it doesn't even necessarily need to be about the project you're working on, but that there's a structure in place for all these team members who are working in their little isolated bubbles to get together. Um, so I suppose that is some initiatives that we have been bringing in and then I'm interested in how that could translate to uh, studio culture and um, architecture students. So I'm sure um, everyone in all the schools will have their own ideas, but here's just some to get started. So the project presentation um, that I see easily translating into kind of uh, sharing project reviews. So um, obviously in the pre-COVID times when um, we were in our physical buildings, uh, reviews happened and uh, depending on the space available, you know, other years might be able to listen in. So, you know, I remember vividly and I don't know, I was second or third year listening in on a fifth year crit and just being mesmerized by their drawings and thinking like, wow. And I didn't even no idea how they could possibly get to that level and uh, how they managed to make that drawing and looking back I think it was just Photoshop but at the time I thought it was some magic sorcery that had been able to produce these incredible things but it was you know it, you learned that way because you saw the older years work and you thought wow you know I want to get to that level and um, so you know it could be as easy as the schools of architecture sending the links out for the interim reviews for the final reviews to the whole school rather than just their years um, or it could be more formalized where I don't know maybe some the top three second year projects are presented to the first years or the fifth years to the fourth years or whoever however um, however it's worked but essentially the idea of um, just uh, sharing not just among in, amongst your group but uh, amongst the wider school then the Friday fix, um, Alana seems to have that really under control, <laughs> essentially. That's uh, really the idea for that, sharing tips and tricks, um, sharing knowledge, really. Um, so, you know, I've just included this lovely model photo that one of my first years did, I think, last year. Um, and she made this amazing model without gluing, you know, it was just all folded. So, you know, someone could come on and she could come on and show us how that's done. Or this is an image. Um, of uh, a girl I know who just graduated from her master's in Cork and you know like I would love to know how that image is made you know I, it seems pretty incredible I think that would be an interesting thing or it could even be as simple as I looked up this you know I was looking up this detail in detail magazine I managed to get my hands on it or a digital copy and I you know spent an hour figuring really figuring out how it works and um, you know I'm gonna share that knowledge now for 15 minutes and so yeah Alana, as I said, has that under control. <laughs> so, and then the team check-in and really uh, self-evident, very similar to how we're doing it, maybe, uh, you know, just acknowledging that there is there is that social isolation in working from home. And one of my first years mentioned that, you know, it's, oh, it, people are too busy to check in with each other because they're, you know, they have so much to do, but actually that's, you know, I, I get it and I get it and I get that feeling, but 
that's the wrong way to approach it because by checking in, you will maybe lift some of that burden and, you know, maybe it's a, a buddy system that gets introduced or maybe it's just a, a yeah, coffee check-in where people, you know, see how each other are getting on. And although people might think they're too busy and that it's not that useful, actually it really is because that informal learning and the connectedness and the, the collaboration that w was so intrinsic to the physical studio culture really needs to, you need to make more of an effort essentially to do that um, in this virtual world. Um, and that's really it for me, I think. So um, I will hand back over. Thanks, Miriam. That's that's wonderful. Um, no, I think um, like as, as you were talking about some of the things, um, you know, this idea of of formality in our new world and and the the effects of a, a more informal um, review or talk versus a more formal one, the scale of that, and just the the kind of social expectations of groups that sit around the screen in those different types of environments are things that I think we're all becoming really aware of now. I know, you know, depending on the the, the year group and also the ask of the project in the reviews, you know, some students would be really reluctant even to turn their cameras on at times. Mm. Um, so uh, I think as well, you know, a kind of a way to measure the success of some of these online exchanges is definitely through the, the talking afterwards. What, what happens as a consequence of this and how is that captured in some way? So um, I think they're all things that actually as we go through a full academic year with the knowledge that we're going to be in this type of restricted environment um, are things that we need to be trying to embed in and I think, you know, certainly the idea of sharing those links of the reviews across the schools or between the year groups or something like that would be you know super welcome um, in terms of, of really I suppose even just the purpose of, of these sessions on current which is what they're trying to do so thank you so much for sharing no problem um, I'd like to hand over now to our second guest, Kevin Oliver who's an American architect joining us today from the early hours in Cleveland Ohio uh, Kevin has established his own practice, uh, Oliver Architecture, in 2011 in his hometown. And I've known Kevin since we studied in architecture school together back in Ithaca, and then I think again in Rome. And uh, upon graduating, uh, we both ended up sticking around in Ithaca and spending the summer teaching on the Cornell Summer Studio. Kevin, as I recall, uh, was one of those uh, perpetual studio rats. He was always there. He was always making. He was always chatting. And more importantly, he was always there helping other people. Um, and through that chatting, and I suppose what Miriam had mentioned there, just that effort of being available for a chat, you know, you lift your own burden and you also help someone else with theirs. Um, so I think in that regard, Kevin's quite a natural teacher in a way. And so with that, I'm going to hand over to Kevin, who's going to talk us through some of his interesting works, one of which he's entitled Outside In. So over to you, Kevin. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to hopefully share my screen here. So thank you, Jen, for asking me to uh, speak and give a presentation. So um, this is outside in and hopefully it has two meanings one being that um, we used to be outside doing things interacting with people and now to a very great extent and getting greater by the day here in the u.s we're back inside um, separated trying to find ways to continue to collaborate um, also um, we've over the last two years probably almost three years now uh, have been involved in the medical marijuana industry and doing projects for them um, in Ohio, which is a new um, entity that is becoming more and more prevalent in the US. And really, um, that is a process of uh, almost to a T taking the exterior agricultural uh, history of growing and farming and bringing it indoors for various reasons, whether they're financial or technical. Um, so this first image kind of maybe piggybacking on Miriam's um, office culture uh, discussion and uh, new techniques. We have six people in the office maximum at a given time. So we are not a large office, but this is, I think the day after we sent everybody home, um, various monitors removed from monitor stands, laptops and PCs carted home. It was um, 
a very effective but very disorganized uh, process and everyone set up at home immediately. And one of the things that um, we started to do was to have a mandatory morning meeting where everybody showed up, you know, at 10 a.m., no matter what, to have this meeting. You couldn't schedule meetings for that. There was no, you know, I can't do this today because I have another meeting. Um, and the other requirement was that you had to have your video camera on. So um, there was a little bit of hemming and hawing there, but I, you know, basically we said, we don't care if you don't have pants on, if you're sitting in bed, if you're outside, it just there's something to the act of putting a camera on, making sure you're there and interacting. And in a sense, it probably limits the amount of eye rolling and huffing and puffing if, if you're taking part in that conversation. So surprisingly, I expected an incredible amount of pushback to that. And then, you know, half a week into it, someone said, this is fantastic. When we get back into the office, we have to keep doing this where it's a mandatory daily meeting. And so that was a nice surprise for me because I expected everyone to, to say, what's this, what's this guy making us do? So we are dealing with that. And at the end of this, um, um, I'm going to go over some of our digital working techniques, mainly sketching based. I know there's a thousand ways to do it, but um, first I wanna sort of go over some of our medical marijuana projects, which a little disappointing presentation wise because we're all legaled up here in the US about this. So all kinds of non-disclosure agreements, so no drawings, just pictures, um, which is not the way we like to do it, but uh, so be it. So this image is the processing facility for medical marijuana. And um, kind of the, the environment in the US now for medical marijuana is government still doesn't like it. There are states that are passing laws to legalize it and create an industry Federally, it's still not legal. Um, and so what's happened, especially in Ohio, where we are, is to get any sort of industry started or to legalize it at all, um, the concessions have been made to make sure it's perceived as being super safe, super secure, and nobody's going to, to take offense at anything. And those requirements are so prescriptive that um, we are, you know, we joke in the office that we're building windowless boxes that we try to make not look like prisons. Um, and that is, that is really tough. And even on the retail side, as we get into dispensaries, um, that's one of our great challenges is how do you make a retail experience nice while having it in a room that has no windows or um, openings and balance security versus customer experience. So this is an overview of the uh, sort of the agricultural side of things, um, which is in an agricultural area, but is an entirely enclosed building um, with processing and indoor growing inside the building, and then more indoor, indoor growing in a greenhouse. Um, this is um, probably 50% the prescriptive um, legal reasons, and also 50% um, of the client's needs and expectations. So what's happening in the industry is a group of people who are frankly scientists and biologists are starting to get resources and facilities to really ramp up their production. And so learning about this industry was equal parts, space planning, designing, um, functional adjacencies, and also learning some of the biology of what they need and how they need to do it. Um, so we're not talking to, you know, people who are, are vaguely interested in what they're working on. You know, everybody has a biology degree or a chemistry degree or both. Um, so it really um, gets, gets drilled down into it. So some of these are the construction photos of this processing and indoor growing facility. Um, you know, the, the start of it is an empty shell um, that gets filled up with, it's very equipment intensive, um, very, technically minded, it is a laboratory and almost a pharmaceutical facility. Um, this is the interior of one of the greenhouse bays, which um, it is a totally enclosed greenhouse. So in this area, in this industry, greenhouse uh, builders and operators are used to greenhouses where you can vent them. You can take advantage of exterior temperatures. Um, the cultivators for the medical marijuana have such a limited square footage they can produce in 
and such a high value product that they are not going to leave that up to chance. So the greenhouse environment has, you can see the blackout shades are drawn here, so they have precise daylight times. Um, there's the artificial lighting um, is extensive and frankly, the um, electrical needs for these facilities are, you know, making new electrical substations, contemplating cogeneration facilities with natural gas. Um, unfortunately, solar, the acreage we would need to use that as a power source for these lights is prohibitive at this point. So really, you know, the cogeneration, um, those are strategies that um, are being implemented to uh, help offset that demand for electricity. So in this greenhouse bay, lights go on for 12 hours, lights go off. It's blacked out. Staff members work in there in darkness with headlamps on. The other portion of it is before the, the product goes into the greenhouse, this is um, an indoor sort of a, a, a seedling facility. So a room that is, again, climate controlled. You can kind of see all of the, the louvers for ductwork coming in. Um, humidity controlled, climate controlled. Again, in that vein of we're not going to leave this up to chance. We're going to make sure uh, we control the environment and deal with uh, pests, humidity, fungus, those types of things. In the extraction areas, again, it's, it's really not discernible from any other kind of laboratory, um, equipment heavy spaces, um, once the product is grown and ready to, to be extracted. So this, you know, kind of speaking of, of how we work uh, collaboratively, some of these things start with very basic sketches um, and move into more and more detailed drawings. These tend to be ways that clients um, grasp certain elements without getting into the weeds with all the details, which can certainly happen in, in these projects. Um, so this initial sketch very quickly becomes from the vendors uh, an almost you know, simplistic diagram that we then have to explain to clients and implement into our plans to make it more of a reality. Um, we do that by marking up um, you know, hard line drawings with more freehand details. This is something that, especially now, we're finding we will send back and forth to engineers and consultants, whereas before we might wait for them to update their entire drawing. We're chatting or slacking messages back and forth this way. We also tend to mix back and forth between the digital modeling and the hand sketches, which I think is probably self-evident, but I think sometimes everyone gets into the weeds of we're gonna model everything. If we need to make a change, we'll model that change, make sure it's all totally internally consistent. And if that cycle takes a week to go through, two weeks to go through, that's okay. We don't like to do that. Um, there's certain times when sort of the immediate feedback of we're gonna sketch while we're talking about this, or we're gonna sketch it and get it to you tomorrow, keeps that train of thought moving keeps that momentum going, which I don't think there's a great way to quantify, but I think everyone feels that, you know, if you stay on track and keep that momentum going, the project continues with its own life forward. Moving into the more retail side are the dispensaries, which again are really a struggle to balance security and regulations versus the customer experience. So we've done five of these, working on the sixth one. Um, they are all in existing buildings, all located a certain number of feet away from a school or a hospital. Again, um, the regulatory environment is changing. I think in five years, it, it will be uh, much more relaxed and reasonable. But for now, we're, we're finding some of these industrial type sites and renovating them into new spaces. Interiors tend towards the um, natural elements with some of the, the, the finishes and fittings. But again, we're working in an environment where um, intense security, physical as well as digital. Um, so finding ways to layer materials and lighting and displays so that we can give a retail experience without necessarily having real products on the floor. Um, you can't necessarily go to a rack, pick something out, pay for it and walk out the door. Um, it is, it's more of a pharmacy than a retail store, despite all of our efforts. 
So I think um, as we work now separate, um, everyone um, is working you know, digitally to a certain extent, whether we do Zoom meetings or um, email or chat information back and forth. And so these next few slides are sort of ways that, that we work through various types of um, drawings and um, use technology to, to help us do that. So these are some concept design drawings, which are very quick, um, fairly loose. But so this is using um, sketchbook from Autodesk and a tablet, whether it's an iPad or a tablet PC um, without, without much underlay. We haven't built a model for this. We're just working through some basic generic concepts to present to clients. These are quick. Um, and I think one of the things that, you know, is maybe I'm sure students will get criticism for, but at a certain point when we start developing ideas, um, I don't think you could look at this drawing and, and pick out a particular material and say that is made out of this specific material, but it helps us start to develop textures, tones, um, information that we'll get layered onto later, but we can relatively quickly and without doing a ton of upfront work, work through ideas and concepts um, with, in a timely fashion. Sort of, again, this, this, this image is drawn, but we've used a model underlay to be the basis for this. So I think uh, what we find ourselves doing a lot is taking a little bit of time to generate a 3D model, whether you use um, Rhino, Revit, I don't know what the, the modeling program of the year is where you are, um, but without spending days or weeks developing a, a model that is presentable, we tend to develop the framework, start drawing on top of it, and then that lets us explore different options and iterations, um, quickly responding to feedback from clients, responding to feedback internally, generating new ideas. Um, even looser are the, the layers on top of that. So maybe this is where I'll, you know, we, we talk about layers a lot when we sketch. Um, layers used to be a big thing with AutoCAD, layers in Photoshop, I'm sure everyone's um, familiar with. But I think one of the key things we found when we do our digital sketching is um, layers are our friend, but there are different friends at different times. So there may be times where um, you use a lot of layers so that if you are working on a drawing and you have an idea that you might want to change, but you don't feel like, you know, having to undo it afterwards, rather than using that undo function, we'll add another layer onto our sketch and draw on that. And then if it works, we can refine the more finalized drawing with that information without destroying information. So at that point, it's almost, and some of these are even, you know, you can kind of see it looks like a piece of trace overlaid. Um, so you can quickly work on ideas instead of sitting at your desk wondering if an idea will work or not. You can visually work it out um, even on the computer um, without a real piece of trace there. Um, so from this kind of rough sketch, um, we can move into a more refined drawing, same software, just using different um, level of detail and refinement. So I think the, um, my personal approach, because you know, we used to, to draw on trace all the time, we still do. So if I can, if I can give tips is um, don't be afraid of still using real trace. Um, there's nothing wrong with drawing something and taking a picture with your phone or your iPad. You don't need to cut it into five pieces and lay it on a scanner. Um, if, you're, if you're in that collaborative mode, it works just fine. And, and I think our clients are receptive to it. Um, I'm sure that studio mates will be as well. Number two is um, don't be afraid to be loose and um, iterative with your drawings. Add layers on, try things out. Don't leave them in your head. Add 15 layers on, group them together to make versions that you can have in the same file. Um, take advantage of that ability to not have to open and close files and work on them. And then the third thing is there are times when you shouldn't be so loose. You know, be specific and precise when you're drawing, even if it is digitally, erase things all the way because when you put in all that time and effort and you're done, there's a nice feeling of, 
I can present this now, it's ready versus, okay, now it's time to stop and do my final presentation. Um, that's not always possible, but there are moments when you can stay diligent and stay precise using those tools so that when you're finished designing, you're also finished presenting. And I'm finished presenting now. Thanks, Kevin. That was that was great. Um, I mean, I, you kind of you, you talked through two very different things there. Um, one was really around the, the the kind of restrictions of designing for the medical marijuana industry, which is one thing. And I, I, I find it just kind of amazingly perverse and taboo. And like all of these kind of legal environments just make you take what something that is entirely natural and make it unnatural in a different way. So I mean, there's a whole kind of a series of questions that might come from that but the other thing that you were talking about is just this idea of agile working and really you know the reflections from your own team about having the camera on and the fact that it's self-governing but that that reinforces you know the support and the kind of collegiality of the whole thing and then also working with your consultants in a less formal way which sounds like, you know, in a way very unprofessional, but it's not because it's actually probably binding that relationship of the design team that bit closer and building trust where you're actually having more um, rapid exchanges more frequently around what is a genuine design process. So you're able to iterate and integrate as opposed to we're going to finish our design. We'll wait until you send us your formal versions. We'll try and mesh the two together, and the kind of the the siloed nature of historic design team practices, which I found really interesting. And in a way, you know, informal isn't bad. Agile is really useful. And I guess I'm I'm interested to know: Do you think that those things are going to stick? in your own practice if everything let's say goes back to an environment that we would recognize from pre-covid times more or less yes i think is the the short answer um, i think internal to our office um, the, the one thing we've learned about the the agility and and maybe i think i think you're right that informal is an interesting word because it does feel more informal but i think we are also um, we're forced to be more respectful of um, people's time and priorities. So if someone is, and I'm guilty of this, but if someone's in the office and I need something, I will shout over there and say, hey, you know, what is this thing? Where, do, where did it come from? How do we do it? And there are times when that's very good, but there are also times where if you're in your flow and doing your work and I'm shouting across the room for something, well, you know, you want to shout back, Go do it yourself. It's not that hard. Um, but if you're, you know, if if you're doing your thing and I need to reach out to you for an online chat or send you something, it allows everyone a little bit of space, which I think they will continue to take. And from a very practical standpoint, pre-COVID, we weren't set up to allow someone who says, "Hey, listen, I'd like to work from home two days a week this yeah. week." We had no, you know, my my immediate reaction would be like, "Well, there's no way. Like, how would you possibly get work done?" Whereas now we have the, the technology set up to do it and the trust of, no, we can do this. So, mm -hmm. you know, I see us doing that in the future. Cool, cool. Well, thanks, Kevin. And thanks, Miriam. Um, I'm keen to, to hand over to Alana because everything both of you spoke about you, relates so much to what is happening in terms of the student experience right now. Um, so Alana Brunton, who's hosting the Common Ground segment, which is the student-led segment of the show, which seems to be growing in terms of interest and also contributors, is here today with two of our officers from the ASA, David Bell and Willow Murray. So Alana, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, great stuff. Um, what can I say? Like the whole, this whole um, ep episode of the Zoomcast today has been just so relatable, I think, to both people working in practice and, and to the students. So it's like a, a complete blurring of the lines. Like it's, it's great. I've learned so much. So yeah, I guess it's time for the students to take over. And um, we're back. This is our third segment of Common Ground this week on the TU Dublin Takeover of the Zoomcast. Um, again, welcome back. I'm Alana Brunton. I'm a first year MRX student in TU Dublin in the Dublin School of Architecture. Um, Miriam, Kevin, again, yeah, it was great to hear about like the knowledge sharing and, and the Friday fix and this kind of uh, kind of shouting back to even your own studio days, um, Miriam, and showing these like amazing, beautiful drawings that you see when you're a younger student. Again, the 
I think Philip and I were speaking about it on the segment on Wednesday, this kind of idea of the big scary renders that you know we all want to know how to do because um, they really embellish your project at the end. And uh, yeah, Kevin, it was great to see, um, you know, even in the office, the, the doing the sketching and the overlaying and how you can use the model as an underlay. I really enjoyed like that, those few tips that you gave um, because I think sometimes computer modeling, it can, you think it's kind of just a thing that can be used at the end um, to represent kind of the final product, but it's great to see like how, how it can be utilized from early on. So there's my point, there are my relatable points that I wanted to throw out uh, from listening. Uh, yeah, so again, this segment, uh, it's inspired by 101 Things I Learned in Architecture School by Matthew Frederick. Uh, today we'll actually be speaking about lessons 29 and 99 that I spoke about with Philip on Wednesday, but I did stick to what I uh, said that and we're not closing the book on each one of these specific lessons because, um, you know, everyone has their own perspectives and their own objectives and we all, all do encounter them. So that can be the mantra of the week is lesson 29 and 99. So I think I'm delighted, well, I think I'm delighted to have Dave, er, David Bell and Willow Murray joining me from the ASA on the Common Ground uh, segment. So without further ado, guys, I'll let you introduce yourselves. Thanks very much, Alana. Um, I think Willow, there you have the presentation. Yeah, I'm just setting it up now. Hopefully, everyone can see this. Um, yeah, all good. Should be full screen now. Yeah, so um, Alana reached out to us um, about a week ago and asked us to discuss this 101 things uh, I learned in architecture school. And David and I went through the book, and the two things that stood out to us were lesson 29 and lesson 99, which is Firstly, being process oriented, not product driven, is the most important and difficult skill for a designer to develop. And secondly, 99 is just, just do something. Um, so when we opened the book, these two really, really stood out to us. We messaged Alana and she said, I've already spoken about them, but she said it was interesting that they are that relatable, that everybody is uh, wanting to speak about them. And I think certainly Miriam and Kevin both touched on, on various aspects of these two points earlier on. Um, the first one here, process oriented, not product driven, is certainly something that plays an everyday part in an architectural student's, an architecture student's life. I mean, David and I, when we, when we looked at it last night, so some of these um, nine points stood out to us, but number seven in particular, accepting as normal the anxiety that comes from not knowing what to do. Um, yeah. It's something um, when you start a new project, you kind of forget how you started the last one and you're looking at this blank page and you're afraid of kind of doing something wrong and like you think too much about things or you're, you, you end up not doing anything because you're afraid that you, uh, you won't do it right. And you can very easily get sucked into um, the brief, which is always very helpful. But I think the next slide actually is uh, an actual screenshot from our brief this year and it's like these are helpful as a guideline but you can very easily get sucked into just seeing these things and they can kind of be almost too prescriptive and you, they can limit your design somewhat and um, I think the next slide shows a, a project myself and Willow worked on back in first year and uh, it's number two Willow Road by Erno Goldfinger which we both love but we kind of got entranced by the, the stairs and like looking back, this model isn't very good, but at the time we were obsessed with the stairs and we spent so long making that stairs that we forgot about what was happening around us. And this picture is kind of funny because we, we didn't photograph the rest of it at all. We just kind of focus on this and we were very much kind of thinking about producing the stairs rather than uh, thinking about the whole building. Yeah, we, we, we spent, I'd say, about three days working on the stairs and the rest of the building was so forgotten that you can see in the photo that we didn't even cut the walls to the right height. Um, so the stairs didn't line up with the rest of the building. Um, and it just goes like, that, it's on that brief, just that's what first year Dave and I were doing. We were working to the brief. We were getting those 1 is 100 plans, sections, elevations. Um, and we weren't exploring outside that. We weren't making sketch models, doing these 
um, interim sketches and just working on things that are outside of the prescribed. And we were just focusing on what we were told to do and trying to get these beautiful drawings and everything had to be perfect. But I think as we, as we have gone up through the years, we've learned that that is not how it is at all. Um, this is an example I have from third year where her second year, where I just wanted a structural axle and nothing else. Like, I just wanted this drawing and I worked quite a while on this drawing and it ended up being not as fruitful as I thought it would be. It was just me working for an ends that had really no means. Um, it was ended up being absolutely meaningless or not absolutely meaningless, but it, it just you know, I was, I was working for a product and there was no process to it. And I learned a lot from this drawing because it was, it was hellish, hellish to draw. Um, it took hours. So this then goes on to, to bring us into the idea of, of how this works with COVID. Because now we have to present online three days a week when form, formerly we would have just taken a piece of butter paper over to a desk and sat down with our uh, lecturers and just walked walk through all of our little drawings and sketches and now all of a sudden we have to put this online and we have to present it and it becomes a pdf and that conversation that was there before has become a presentation this is something that david and i thought was was very important when we discussed this um yeah and um, i think we, we all spend so much time now and i think um uh, miriam kind of touched on us a bit and kevin also um we, we spend so much time on CAD and we kind of forget about actually designing. So say if we have three kind of desk tutorials a week, I, I'd say we spend hours before each one actually putting our sketches together in a way that's somewhat presentable on a screen, which is really important, but it kind of distracts you from the whole process. Um, so I think we kind of need to force ourselves almost to not get too caught up in the aesthetics of things and kind of just be a bit looser about how we work. Yeah, certainly what Kevin said earlier about not being afraid to just take a photo of a, a sketch and just throw it up. Yeah, That's yeah. certainly something that I found myself tentative to do. Um, which leads us on nicely to the, the last thing, which is just do something. As David said, when you're looking in, at a blank page and you're just thinking, what am I going to do next? Um, COVID really not to talk about the elephant room, but it really um, just blew that out of, out of the park. Like it just, this just do something. When I used to be sitting in, in studio and I had all my friends around and we'd bounce ideas and it would just take, you know, 10, 15 minutes and I'd start drawing. David and I were discussing the other day, if we just were both at home, not talking to each other. Yeah. You know, so isolated, just doing nothing because we had no idea how to start. We had nobody there just being like, it's okay, everything's fine. So Yeah, it, it kind of leads back to the anxiety of not really knowing what to do. This drawing is, I remember uh, the, the second semester of second year, so it was during lockdown, and it was kind of our first taste of working from home with COVID, and I was really stuck on a project and was getting caught up in CAD and Photoshop and how to present it that uh, I, I wasn't making any progress at all. And um, so I kind of forced myself to step away from the computer and make a, a really messy sketch that it doesn't look good, but it actually helped me solve a lot of problems. Um, and I think that's something that we're all kind of forgetting to do at the moment um, is just kind of the, the looser, uh, freer way of working. Um, I think Willow has a yeah example um, as well. The looser, the kind of agility, as Kevin Riley put it earlier, um, that you have when you're sitting at a desk with pens and paper, and everybody can draw on the same page. Um, you just lose that. So I, at this is the start of our current project. Um, I I had no idea what I was doing, so I literally just took out a piece of butter paper and randomly started. Well, yeah, randomly started drawing shapes. Um, just in, in, in an attempt to do something. Um, I wasn't sure what I was doing or where I was going. And my current project looks nothing like any of these drawings. Um, but it was just the, the act of doing something. Um, 
was was a huge thing that I've learned, and it, it's been um, definitely a, a bigger learning curve during COVID. Um, when, as David put it, when you're on CAD, it's so rigid, and everything is so structured and ordered. To to just take a step back and just take out a pen and paper or a crayon or something and just draw and just be relaxed and be calm about it. It's certainly something that I had to like definitely learn during COVID. Yeah, it's been a big learning curve. Um, I think that's pretty much all we have to, to show. Yeah. We, we kind of didn't really know what to show, so we kind of... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah thanks thanks for showing like a lovely array of, of drawings and, and process of work because that's that's i think the whole point of the segment that it's it's not you're not presenting this like one of your past projects how you did at a crit at the end of the year you know we're talking about the process and the the parts that we we all encounter and again lesson uh, 29 and 99 i'll be i'll be saying those in my sleep now but it's it's <laughs> It really is there too. I do think they're probably two of the most relatable uh, lessons in the book because it's something that you can't escape. But I just, uh, a note on that, I, I nearly think at the beginning of, of COVID, I think that I was very much, okay, grand, it's all on the computer. I'll mm. you know do my lovely computer model in Revit or I'll work on CAD because I'll be screen sharing anyway. But I think um, it's kind of taught us that it is a slow process and you know, you're trying to set it out all nice so you can explain it to someone but really you know if we were all in a group call designing now I'd say oh like I, I can't do it on CAD and I'll you know do a, a quick sketch here about the ideas and I'll be doing this you know oh can you can you see that like what you know yeah. what you know how are we going to resolve turning this corner or whatever so in a sense I think maybe it has actually forced me to go back to sketching and be more mindful of it it's reminded me it's, it is a lot quicker even if I am just holding it up to the camera yeah it, it's kind of thinking like you think it takes more time to sketch and then scan it than mm. it does do CAD but the payoff is that your whole uh, process is slower with CAD or things yeah. on the computer I think anyway. mm -hmm. yeah both are good but um, there's pros and cons but yeah, I think it's um, a bit of a, a bit of a revelation uh, I've had with it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's um, worked for good in a sense. Guys, that was a really interesting, um, a really interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. So well done. And um, I think it was particularly interesting for me because I taught David and Willow when they were in first year. So I'm remembering, you know, so I, even when David was saying about the the you know trusting the process rather than worrying about the product and being anxious about the product, I'm literally remember sitting in a desk with David and I think it was a bike shop and you were so worried about the the final result and you know he, he, David was doing a brilliant job of designing it and he was going through the process and it was it was great and I was kind of trying to say you know this this is what it's all about you know like going through the you know so it's really nice to um to see you now giving your advice to the younger students so well done and what I also really enjoyed was this kind of the thread I think that has come through all of the presentations really today which is about promoting informality rather than formality so through meetings but also through drawings and I think that to me has definitely been the kind of common thread that we've all agreed upon. Yeah when you mentioned learning from your peers and just talking to them and that's a big part of the process earlier that was a relief to hear that it's not just students it's it's everybody throughout mm -hmm. the various Great. tiers of architecture that are really, you still learn you're like you're you're going to be a hundred and still learning. <laughs> yeah. And the way of writing the, the, even when you're in practice or, or interning, that it's okay to at times ask the 500 questions, Miriam, about certain things. Completely. I'm yeah. still asking. I'm still constantly asking people who have more experience than me, you know, and how did you do that? Detail? How does that work again? And, you know, it, it's, it's never ending. And even, People, you're asking people with less experience because maybe they have experience in different things than you have. So it's not even just, you know, oh, like you ask less questions, the, the higher up in the pecking order you get. I'm sure, Kevin, you're the same that you might be asking, you know, staff that are, you know, working for you even about their their ideas about things because, you know, they might have a different, uh, come out from a different point of view or have different sensibilities about it. And, and so it's definitely, uh, definitely okay to always ask questions. <laughs> I, I have a question, if I can. Um, 
Alana and David, are you in school, like, is everyone modeling things in Revit? Is that sort of the go-to? Um, hey, I made this model and I can render it now, or is there a mix? Um, I'm not sure about Alana's year, but I know in our year, um, we're third year, so people are kind of discovering 3D modeling. And um, I found, like, I'm learning Revit at the moment, and uh, I, I like learned Photoshop and CAD last year, and I kind of kind of took over a bit. So it's kind of about forcing ourselves to go back to the more uh, elemental ways of designing. I think it's just pen and paper. Um, Got it. So yeah. So my I don't know. I tell everybody in the office, but my Revit warning is that um, when you go to work somewhere and they want you to make buildings, fantastic, great. The problem is that you have to make that thing when you're modeling it. You have to decide, oh, this is going to be a door and I'm going to drop in a window. Mm -hmm. So the sketch you have on the screen right now, you know, I don't even know how I would model that in Revit. Like, are those doors? Are those windows? Like, who knows? And so yeah. the downside of Revit is you have to decide right away and there's not that space of, you know, I'm making this thing, I wonder what it is, right? And so all the opportunities, you know, if there's all these branches of the way things can go, it tends to snip a lot of those off because whether you're conscious of it or not, that, you know, that opening on the bottom right, you've made as a window. And so now no matter what you do when you're working in your model, it's a window and you can change it, you can modify it, but at some point, well, that's a window, you know, the, the, the time-tested, take your sheet of paper and rotate it 90 degrees, what happens, you can't do that. So that's my, you know, that's my, we, we try to delay that Revit moment as long as we can. And honestly, if I'm, you know, pitching software, um, we, we sometimes will do the SketchUp study model. So SketchUp is, it's free, it's simple. Um, you can make things. But boy, is it a bear if you have to modify or change or if you make this elaborate 3D model and then a week later someone says, we need to move this room over here, you might as well throw it away. And our knee-jerk reaction to that was, well, this is a useless piece of software. But then we started approaching it where, no, no, these SketchUp models are little study models that we would have cut out of cardboard and glued together, you know, without measuring or using a straight edge. So it's okay if we toss them aside. We're not going to spend two weeks working on them, but at least it lets us keep it ambiguous and keep our options open before saying, okay, now we're going to decide. So that's, that's my Revit warning talk. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, that's very helpful. I actually, on that, when you say try to delay the process of Revit, I studied architectural technology for years, so I learned Revit before I learned anything really architectural. So I had to do a lot of unlearning and I'm now finding myself enjoying making physical models and not wanting to go back to Revit, which is kind of an interesting thing. It's like the opposite of what you were saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I, oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, Jennifer. I was just saying, I think uh, Kevin's oh, tip was brilliant of, um, and, and I do it as well in work where you make a really basic 3D model, maybe because, you know, you have to just to see what the scale of it is massing wise in context. And then you can, it can literally just be like a mass, a mass, you know, even in Revit. And then you sketch over it with your butter paper. Um, and that way you don't have to decide whether the cut is, you know, as Kevin is saying, is a, a window family or a door family or uh, whatever it is. And so I think that's a really good process to bear in mind, you know, just that, that combination of using both, uh, both systems. Yeah, that's actually what I was going to uh, say, Miriam. I, um, I, I think across, across the students in the MRC, there's a, like, there's a mixture of, of skills. Many people would use like Rhino or SketchUp or Revit. I maybe if I, I know you were saying about the kind of the rev the Revit trap, but I I that would be probably my preferred program. But I would start off with the mass and slow like keep the model simple and slowly build up the layers to hopefully have a, a fairly um, good representation of the building by the end. But then you do I, I do find I I get kind of taken with, you know, how amazing it can look when I put it through Enscape and things like that. I, I, I think 
you know, the representation of the building can look so realistic and, and, and really good that you can get kind of addicted to sticking with that program all the time. Um, and again, I think it's important to make sure you're, you're using your sketching and, and, and going, you know, going back to the more, to the more simple um, aspects of, of the design rather than getting stuck with families and so on and so forth. I think on that point as well, like because um, 3D rendering can be so uh, realistic and, and you can run it through software that makes it look like it's a real building, it sort of can trick you into thinking your design is perfect. Yeah. And not think and, and sort of takes away your ability to think critically about it because because you've made this thing that looks finished, even though you might only be at the start of or in the middle of a process, you know? Mm -hmm. We've, it's, it's um, from an from a architect client perspective, um, renderings at times have backfired on us. So we, we will sometimes intentionally um, dumb them down, so to speak. So even if we're at a point where we can, you know, render exactly the material we're proposing, if it's at an early stage and you present that to a client, they can get a little offended and I don't know if that's too harsh of a term really because now they feel like you're shit you know ramming this down their throat of like this is done you have no more opportunity to give input and you either like it or it's over and so more often than not if we do that with clients at an early phase they're just you know they they can't they feel like they can't give input and so you know to that point of making it seem like it's done when it's not that that is bad in practice as well so we you know we balance that that same uh, struggle then yeah we, we have the exact same thing so in recent years actually um and the exact same issues happen you show a client a render and they think but hold a minute you know we're we're nowhere near a finished building you know and they they you know it's it's worrisome and um, so we've actually started using and um, working with an illustrator and um often we uh you know especially in earlier stages we um we show the client illustrations of you know buildings or areas or uh, place making or whatever it is um and again though we'll use that dual thing of i'll you know we'll be working up a model but the model you know isn't that presentable or it's too realistic to scare off the client so i'll send the illustrator um my you know terrible half done revit um model and then um, the illustrator will be able to develop it up in a much looser, less defined manner. And then we show that then to the client. I mean, we would do it ourselves if we had the time, but anyway, this illustrator is great. And we, um, and then, and then the client's delighted because then I've, and it, it's more suitable for that stage, you know, sometimes. Um, so I definitely wholeheartedly agree with all, uh, all Kevin's points. Okay. Well, I'm after learning so much, hopefully, um, yeah, we hopefully we lifted some of the burdens that we we're talking about with people and um, being on their own, kind of stuck in their own head when working up with their uh, working up their projects and their designs. And I know I feel really helped anyway. So I really enjoy the conversation. And um, yeah, just to reiterate, uh, please, if you do wish to feature in the future um, on the um, common ground segment. Um, I'm sure my email will be in the description. I'm Alana Brunton. Please do uh, reach out to me. I'm sure. Um, David or Willow as well will be able to, to link you up if you if you want to feature on the segment or do reach out to Jennifer Boyer as well. I know um, the Zoomcast will, the, the common ground section of the Zoomcast will be continuing with uh, WIT and on, um, with UCD as well. So uh, that's really exciting and, and fantastic to hear and long live common ground, I suppose. <laughs>